Hi everyone. So we're going to start off by um, introducing our new online uh, lab series by talking about the spectroscopy of visible light and determining Planck's constant. So I emailed you all earlier yesterday, but what I'm going to do for this very first week is that everything is going to be due at midnight tonight. Um, I will send out exactly what you need to do. In the future, there will be very definitive deadlines, but tonight is going to be um, just at midnight, just to make sure we're all on the same page before uh, we officially launch into running uh, all our labs online. So, let's, with that, let's get started. So, let's introduce light, right? So, light from the sun is called white light, and there's a reason for that. So you'll see a flash for a second. Usually when you see the flash, I'm switching to writing with my stylus. So when we're dealing with white light, right, it has a continuous spectrum. Why would you call it continuous? Well, from our perspective as humans, we see all the colors from red to blue. You might be questioning why, when I'm taking a chemistry class, why am I looking at light? Well, Scientists and chemists, physicists, and most hard scientists use light as a way to investigate things that we cannot see with our eyes. It seems a little bit counter, uh, counterintuitive, but properties of light make it very, very, very useful for investigating things we actually can't see. And so light is a very important tool for a scientist. So this is going to be, you know, a little bit of a learning curve. So you can see things popping up on my screen as I'm trying to switch between slides. More than likely, I need to stop my drawing. There we go. All right. So light and the property of waves. So what light actually is to the best of our theoretical knowledge, and this no one knows beyond this, is that it is a, uh, a vibration in the electromagnetic field. What is a field? Well, a field is something that permeates um, every space in the universe. So think about gravity. We take it for granted, but technically gravity, we don't know if it's a force. We hypothesize that it is. But as far as we know, gravity is a field, and that field is bent. And because of that, that's why we have this attractive force towards the center of the, our planet. So that is a field. Right now, you are experiencing the gravitational field. It is the same idea why, if you've been paying attention to scientific news, when we have uh, LIGO. So L-I-G-O, LIGO, is a instrument that can detect variations in the gravity's field. And that's, we actually can, we can actually see as waves of gravity pass through the Earth, from supernova, so wow, I said that really wrong. Super, super, oh Jesus, supernova, um, and also black hole mergers. So it's a ripple, is what it is, in the space time continuum, and then is a ripple in gravity. Light behaves very similarly. So light is a wave, which we see here, represented in one dimension, but light is a ripple or a wave in the electromagnetic field. Every one of those ripples contains a certain amount of energy. So how do we quantify this energy? There's two ways. One is through the wavelength of the light. The other is going to be the frequency, which is not shown on this slide. I'll explain that a little bit more. Amplitude, which you do see, amplitude just means how bright something is. So the bigger the amplitude, the brighter something appears. But it actually is not that important when talking about the energy of a light. We won't go into that because that deals with quantum mechanics. But for us, what we care about is wavelength. So we have our wavelength. Oop, that should be an H. So we have our wavelength. Wavelength is represented by the symbol lambda. And so you'll notice I've been trying to write in cursive. Right now I've ordered a better stylus. The stylus I have now only really works if I write in cursive. 
It's all going to be a little bit different than what I usually write on the board, so please bear with me as we, uh, or as I try to make this better for you all. So we have our wavelength. So what we notice, it's li it's quite literally a measurement, which you could, if you could pause a wave of light and measure it with a meter stick, you could literally measure the distance between either crests, which is at the tops of all those waves, or the troughs. For us, as wavelength decreases, so we can see we have a big wavelength here and a smaller wavelength here, so as lambda decreases, energy is actually going to increase. Why? We'll talk about that in a little bit. There's a relationship between lambda and energy. As the frequency of light, or the shortness of the wavelength, decreases. So we have these small, more waves passing through per a given time. The energy is going to go up. So that's our first property of waves, lambda. Our s oh, there we go, lambda, wavelength. Our second property that we'll deal with is going to be frequency. And I'm trying to work on, I don't know why Screencast is putting, oh, there, maybe that got rid of it, I don't know. There used to be a red line on the screen. Hopefully you can see it now. But the second property of waves, and you'll see a flash for a second. There we go. We had our wavelength, lambda. Oops. Let's undo that. We had wavelength, lambda. The second property of a wave that is going to be important to us will be frequency. It looks like the letter V. It is not. It is the Greek letter nu. Let me try doing that a little bit better. N-U. So, nu is what that symbol is and it is the how many times so we can take a look at every single one of these peaks it's how often the peaks pass a detector at per given second so if there's more peaks as this wave moves through in one second well the frequency will be higher if you have a low wavelength so the frequency, so the peaks are further spaced apart, less peaks will pass a given detector at a given, uh, in one second. So as wavelength decreases, what we're going to see is frequency increases, and that's going to hold for all types of waves that we talk about. So let's talk about fluorescent lights. Why do they work? So electrons and the atoms inside the gas so we're going to have a gaseous molecule there's going to be a nucleus surrounded by some electron cloud there will be an electron and there's going to be some sort of empty um, orbital that that electron can jump into right so when the electrons in these atoms drop back to lower energy levels so let's imagine we have a photon which i'll abbreviate as h nu and we'll talk about a little bit in the future why H nu is the abbreviation for um, a photon, because it is Planck's constant H, which is what we're trying to determine, times the frequency at which the light um, is emanating at will determine its energy. So we have a particle of light, H nu, indicated by the arrow, hits that electron. The electron will then absorb all of that energy and jump to a new energy level. Upon exiting that en energy level, high energy, we the universe does not like high energy. What will happen is that electron will jump back down. While jumping back down, it will emit a new frequency of light. And I'm, again, abbreviating that with H nu. What this will do is give us discrete energy levels. Discrete means very defined, right? So what that means is, and because we're dealing with quantum mechanics, the energy that is emitted in the form of light is very quantized. And I mean by very is absolute. It is one energy. That's it. 
It does not care where the electrons start. Oh, it does care where it started and where it went. But there is no half measures. If that electron was in one energy level and it goes to the next, this different difference in energy is exact because the energy is exact. The, um, the frequency of light emitted is exact. So when you see these two lines here on the uh, on the, um, the figure, that means this is coming from one energy level, and maybe the electrons jump to a different energy level, and so it's higher in frequency. It's a different color. Oop, trying to move to the next slide, and it's not working as well as I'd hope. There we go. So what I've shown here, and this is what we'd be doing in lab, is that we have a source of light. That light is coming out. It hits a prism. And then what that prism will do, let me undo that, is going to separate the light into different frequencies. So effectively, the light is going to change direction when it hits the prism based on its energy. Lower energy will be deflected less, that's why we see red, and higher energy will be deflected more, which is what we're seeing down here with purple. If you had something like hydrogen, so pure hydrogen, what you will see is actually four discrete colors. Why are they discrete? Well, because the hydrogen, so the energy levels in a hydrogen atom. There is no half measures. Like you see, there is nothing in between these two frequencies. Why is that the case? Well, there's an energy level here, 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 and here, and there's nothing in between. So it's an unusual property of quantum mechanics, but as far as we can tell, it is true. So why does this happen? So what I reserved this slide for is to draw um, what an electron energy level is. So imagine we have some arbitrary amount of energy. There's an electron sitting at this energy level. There's a new energy level here. I'll call this two in this one. If I have a particle of light Oops, that looks terrible. If I have a particle of light called a photon, and it is absorbed by this electron, what we're going to see is the electron itself, I'll erase that, absorbs the energy and then is promoted to a higher energy level. There is no in-between. This has been proven experimentally. Electrons cannot partially absorb the energy of a photon. It is all or nothing. And that's why we see discrete energy levels. It is only going to absorb a photon if it has an exact amount of energy to go from here to here. However, let me rewrite that. Having an electron at a high energy level is unstable. What will happen is this electron will spontaneously fall back to where it came from, but where it came from at energy level one was lower energy. So to lose that energy, a photon is emitted, H nu. Where is it getting that energy? Well, it's actually from electricity. And that's why you need to plug in your light to make it function. But effectively what the light is doing is pumping energy into those electrons. The electrons go up in their energy level. The electrons fall back down. And usually this happens within picoseconds. It's very, very quick. But as it falls back down, it's emitting photons. So what you're seeing, so we put electricity in and the light comes out. So if we were doing this in class, we'd be dealing with LEDs. LED is a acronym. It stands for light. Oops, let me move, go back. 
light emitting diode. So what LEDs are is they only emit exactly one color of light. Effectively, that's one frequency or one wavelength of light is what we're looking at. How does this happen? Well, light is emitted when an excited electron moves from a lower energy orbital. So that would be going from the low energy down here to a high energy orbital and then falling back down. And it releases energy, oops, and it releases energy in the forms of photons as it falls back down. Because it's only enough energy to go between one energy level, what we're seeing is individual discrete frequencies of light or individual colors as our body and our brain processes it. So what is the relationship between wavelength and frequency? So what we see here is we have our unit for wavelength or lambda. We have our unit for frequency, which is, uh, sorry, unit for frequency, which is nu. There is a relationship between the two. So if we multiply wavelength times frequency, we will get a constant. What is that constant? That constant is the speed of light. So light, oh, I spelled, oh, let me fix that. That's not how you spell light. L-I-G-H-T. So the, frequent, the speed of light is constant. The speed of light is exactly 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That is not coincidental that it is a whole number. Humans have defined it as this number. So it's not some cosmic sign that things are ordered because we have an exact number for the speed of light. That is not true. Humans have defined the speed of light to be this speed. How is the speed found? Well, it is a product. So product being a multiplication of the, freq of the, the wavelength times the frequency. When we multiply the units together, I already mentioned that wavelength can be literally measured with a meter, a meter stick or a ruler. Frequency is the amount of waves per second, so we can call that just 1 over seconds, so it just means per second. m times 1 is m, nothing times seconds is seconds. We can see that the product will be a velocity. That velocity is the speed of light. How fast is the speed of light? Incredibly quick. 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Sounds quick. Takes 8 minutes from the sun to reach Earth. So, still slow on cosmic scales. So, how are we going to define this relationship to energy? All I have done is define how wavelength lambda and frequency nu are rela related we have a second equation. The frequency of light, nu, multiplied by some constant is going to be equal to the energy of that photon. As the frequency decreases, the energy goes up. Why is that the case? We'll take a look, or you can just think about this. Remember, think about the idea of a microwave. A microwave oven, oops, you go back for a second. A microwave oven actually deals with the quantity mu, micro, which is 10 to the negative sixth, 10 to the negative sixth meters. That's why it's called a microwave. When you get to higher energies, you'll be dealing with gamma, gamma rays, which can be very, very high energy. We're talking 10 to the positive power of what the, the um, the frequency will be. It can be very, very large. However, we're not going to worry ourselves with that. All we worry ourselves with is that I know the frequency, I can multiply it by a constant, and turn out the energy. What is that constant going to be? Oops. 
I should write a little bit more clearly, is going to be H, or Planck's constant. Like I said, it'll get a, no, a better stylus. Hopefully today is what it will be. Um, and then I can write a little bit more clearly on my iPad, which then will be projected to my, uh, my laptop. So, we can now convert between frequency nu and energy E. Right? So, we can use the wavelength of light corresponding to the color of the wavelength. Why? Well, maybe I need to go back a couple of slides. Let me just erase everything I wrote. Let's try this here. We already saw that we know lambda, which is wavelength, times nu, is equal to the speed of light. So there is a relationship, a constant relationship, between lambda and nu. We see that the energy of whatever the particle of light is, or photon, is going to be some constant h times nu. We now have a link between these two equations. Effectively, what I could write is E equals, in this case, what I'm going to do is substitute nu back into this equation. It will be H times C over lambda. So now what we've done from taking the two equations is link energy directly to Planck's constant, the speed of light, which is another constant, and the wavelength that the light is emitted at. So because we have two constants, there's a direct relationship between wavelength and energy as well, despite already having a relationship between wavelength and frequency. Still trying to get good at converting between slides. There we go. So, what are we going to be doing? Well, today we usually do the experiment ourselves and actually, you know, be physically present in the lab. However, what we're going to need to do is I'm going to give you raw data. Oop. Go back. I'll give you raw data to fill in this chart. This will come out later this morning. It will not be in this video. I will send you the raw data and then I will teach you how to process the data. However, what we're going to do is go stepwise through each of these columns to answer all of the questions, ultimately ending up with Planck's constant. Planck's constant being that constant H, which relates frequency to um, energy. What we'll also be doing is practicing some mathematics. So what we'll be doing is introducing the idea, oops, go back. Introducing the, the idea again, you've already seen this, but of standard deviation. This equation looks intimidating. It is not. I will do an example in a future video on how to use it. It has a lot of Greek, but it's not that bad. So I will send out another video explaining how to use this equation in the future. So expect that either this morning or early this afternoon. Safety, we don't worry about too much right now. Your safety concern is staying home and social distancing. Make sure your parents are in good health. Make sure you're in good health. I'm going to make sure I am in good health and I'm constantly checking in on my parents. Uh, who are probably a little bit older than yours, but they're in that high-risk category of being 60-plus now. So forget this slide. Stay safe. What I'm going to be looking for today is you will need to take a picture. Sorry about that. You can probably hear my uh, text messaging. But I'm going to have you take a picture of your... Wow, that is a lot of text. My bad. Um, hand in your yellow pages. I will send you free software so you can take a picture of your notebooks and upload those to EC Learn. It will either be through Dropbox or it will be through, uh, what's the other one? Dropbox or OneNote. I will send you detailed instructions how to do it. Again, if you have trouble, you will not be penalized. This week is to figure things out. All right. I will need your worksheet that will be due in one week. 
So hold off on that. If you finished it today, upload it. We're good. You're done. If not, you need a week. Go for it. All right? I'm also going to need you to upload your, your Excel file to EC Learn. I will send out a video today or this afternoon, so this morning or this afternoon, on exactly what I expect. At this point, it's going to basically be a tutorial. It's probably going to be 100% no matter what if you follow what I do. If you run into trouble, please email, email me ASAP. Again, I am not going to penalize you if you're struggling to learn online. We are trying to get through this together. Don't worry about this. Next week, we'll work on Copper Cycle. So, for now, your only, only instructions and only priority for this lab is to A, stay safe, and B, watch out for that video that I'll be sending out later today on how to finish up the data processing. So, that is the video. We're done. That is it for this week. My goal for today and for this week for all of my classes is to get off the ground. That is it. Again, if you are struggling with getting things uploaded or you're struggling with keeping up, it is fine for this first week. It's almost going back to the first day that we had. Again, we have a grace period. We're going to figure this out together. So, again, let me know if you need help. All right, stay safe.